Hey everyone, you got uh, your host Patrick McLean here, uh, back with a longtime guest. I haven't had the opportunity to talk with him in a while, so excited to get his perspective on many things. Uh, space has obviously been going through a lot over the last couple months, uh, keeping in trend with it changing a lot over the last few years. Uh, we are also here with uh, Jake and Glenn. Um, part of this series we're doing is kind of uh, working with some of the university uh, blockchain club presidents and organizations and kind of pairing them with industry thought leaders like Mark um, and, and letting everyone kind of have an open conversation and, uh, and hopefully inspire some more students who want to get into blockchain. Um, but uh, before we kick it off, uh, you want to briefly introduce yourselves? Uh, Jake, maybe you can kick it off. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. My name is Jake. I am a student at UT Austin right now, studying management information systems and computer science. I originally got involved with the whole blockchain crypto space back in like DeFi summers, so like summer 2020. But that was between like summer 2020 and fall of 2021. I was really just in, in the speculation side of everything. It was really when I came to UT and got involved with the blockchain club here that I really started to just dig deeper than trying to flip a quick buck. Uh, in, the, in the space, got involved as like the head of marketing for the club. So we did a couple of hackathons and I'm now the president of the club. And it, it's really exciting to be leading a, a really passionate group of students. And we have even in this bear market, 40, 50 students coming out to every general meeting, just looking to learn, looking to build, looking to talk. Uh, so it's really motivating to, to have that kind of community on campus here. Uh, aside from Texas blockchain, I'm also the founder of Spawn, a web, a nationwide community of students in Web3. We like to call ourselves like a Web3 student accelerator. We run different mentorship programs. We have different build programs and research programs for students to really just upskill themselves in the space. Uh, the goal is to connect different students at different universities to each other and connect them to mentors and professionals in the industry. So that's a little bit about me and what I'm working on. Uh, Glenn, if you want to go for it. Yeah, thanks for the intro, Jake. Uh, my name is Glenn. I'm a third year student at the University of British Columbia studying finance and data science, uh, more like the quantitative economic side of things. I've been in the blockchain space for about two years as well. Similar to Jake, started off as a passive investor, uh, not too deep into the technical knowledge side, but very quickly started reading into it a lot more and found myself hooked. Around uh, 16 months ago, you know, decided to start a blockchain club here at the University of British Columbia. And since then, we've grown to, you know, from just two members to about 200. Our team is pretty large in size. We mainly focus on like technical workshops. So we've done a whole EVM and Solidity course. Now we're just launching our Rust and Solana course uh, this week, actually. So just trying to bring more people to the ecosystem, just like Jake's doing with Spawn. Um, outside of UBC, I work at an investment fund dealing with digital assets. So we do uh, venture and early stage I'm the, the lead analyst there. So we're basically the VC crypto arm of a pretty prominent family office out of Asia. Um, and also just been sort of working and advising some startups for the last 10 months since my uh, since getting into that. But, you know, happy to kick this off and, and see where we want to take this interview. Looking forward to it. Appreciate it. Mark, you want to give a quick introduction and then I'll, I'll kick us off. Great. So uh, go way back, Patrick, you and I to, to the beginning of Reimagine. Um, I'm the old guy around. I got the white hair and uh, to prove it, although my son says, dad, it's still black in the back. I'm like, no, it's, it's gray. Um, but old guy came out of the endowment world. I worked at my alma mater at Notre Dame. You can see some Notre Dame stuff back here. And then uh, came down here to North Carolina where I am today and ran that endowment a long time ago, 20 years ago, uh, spun out into a firm called Morgan Creek Capital Management. Morgan Creek brought the endowment model of investing to other investors, family offices, individuals, pension funds, smaller endowments and foundations. And five years ago now, actually now coming up on, on six years, started Morgan Creek Digital. Morgan Creek Digital is a venture capital fund uh, that focuses on the digital asset ecosystem. I have migrated most of my time into the digital asset space over the years. So I, you know, my my origins are as an allocator, and today I'm a late in life venture capitalist. So I do mostly venture capital. Though 20% of what we do is in the liquid protocol space. So we do own some Bitcoin, we do own some Ethereum, we do own a few other things, but most of what we do is early stage investing in the ecosystem. 
Awesome. Well, appreciate the introduction, everyone. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, kick us off. And as you kind of alluded to, Mark, you know, we've uh, gone back a little bit. I don't know, maybe this is our eighth or ninth hour or something like that doing interviews. Uh, back in 2021, we, we did like a little TV show concept, right, called Coins. Uh, episode one of that was, was called The War, right? So what was the tone of that, right? So I'd say at the time, Bitcoin was at 60,000. I, I felt like the communication I was starting to get from the industry was like, hey, we've, we've passed that regulatory hurdle. Yeah. They've now accepted it. Coinbase has gone public. We're good now, right? Like, I think people were, and I, and I was kind of sitting there being like, well, are we good or are they waiting, right? Now, I think after this FTX debacle, it's clear that in some sense they're coming for the industry. You could argue that it's smart or not. Uh, they're trying to turn off fiat rails. Uh, they're taking actions against stable coins. I, one hour ago, I just uh, interviewed with Paolo Andrino, the CTO who I've known for a while. Um, and they're using it, they're packaging it up in political pitches, right? Right after F FTX, yeah. they went around and Grand said, you had specific experience dealing with S SBF, I think. And I, I've been actually very curious about your opinion, like through the whole block fire deal, uh, possibly again, even, mm -hmm. you know, through some of your investments in Gemini and, the pseudo effects of what happened to DCG. So my question for you is, and I'm going to stop here a little controversial. Is there any chance you think the FTX incident was the opening salvo for a long planned attack? Do you oh, believe it? hundred percent, hundred, hundred percent. I mean, no question. I mean, yeah. anyone who thinks well, well, hang on, hang on. Let, 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 me, let me cap, let me cap it out here and I'll give it to you. Like, so, so maybe, I, do you believe there's more than meets the eye to Salmon team? Like, were they useful idiots? And on this question, take as much time as you want. I, I want to get like your wide perspective here. I yeah, think you, know, I mean, you don't want me to go too far down the rabbit hole, but look, a couple of things. One, Sam and Caroline are the masterminds of nothing, nothing. Now, look, we were not investors in FTX. You know, we passed three times, not because we're geniuses, not because we knew they were bad guys and gals, just because the numbers never worked. I mean, their first round was at $8 billion. They had no revenues. Second round was at 16 billion with, you know, a few revenues, 40 or 50 million. And then they did the silly round with Sequoia at 32 billion. And, and, and we'll come back to why I think that's all interconnected and why Sam and Caroline are completely useful idiots. They didn't dream this up. They were exploited by a very large group of very powerful people. And this goes back to when we did coins, right? It was kind of fun. We, we did coins and we got all these great people in the industry and we went to the uh, abandoned or retired Federal Reserve Bank building of, I mean, sorry, the Mint, the Mint in San Francisco, right? Where they used to actually make the money out of thin air. And we were all, to your point, we were all feeling like, oh yeah, this is, this is it. Like, no, 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 guys, this is the end that that period 21 was the end of the then they laugh at you phase so there's the famous four line quote that gandhi actually didn't say but whoever said it and gandhi took credit for it or they attribute it to gandhi i don't think he took credit for it because he's a humble guy but uh, he actually didn't say it but you know first they ignored you 2009 to 2015 they ignored us a bunch of nerds and geeks playing with their magic internet money who cares just be gone not interesting. From 2016 to 21, then they laugh at you. They laughed at us. Like, well, what are you guys doing making a documentary about Bitcoin? Ha ha ha, stupid. Bunch of nerds and geeks playing with your magic internet money. 2022 to 2027, then they fight you. This fight started with an assault on the industry through FTX. FTX was simply a vessel. FTX was created by a guy with no experience, no knowledge, no nothing. His parents, super connected. Dad went to law school with all the glitterati in DC. Mom ran this Tumblr basically for political contributions. Not a crypto Tumblr, but literally a, a, a wash, washing machine so you could avert the, the campaign finance laws. And all the big venture funds in Silicon Valley used that to donate money to the Democratic Party. So Sam had this thing called Alameda Research. And they said they were doing arbitrage trades. No, they weren't. 
Find, show me the data. Someone show me the on-chain data of them doing trades. They weren't. Then CZ comes along and says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this. So he pumps some money into it. And a bunch of money from the Epstein estate, which is like crazy, goes in. And suddenly you got this real company. Now, the fact that it was formed like five days after President Biden was elected and Sam was the second largest donor, actually, no, the largest donor to, to Biden's campaign. That's odd, right? It's odd. Um, so fast forward again, uh, this thing goes up and he does the famous Super Bowl thing and names the stadium and names the Berkeley Stadium, right? Or was it, yeah, it was Berkeley, right? The, the college stadium. I think it was Berkeley. Maybe oh, it was. Did they, did, they do, did they do UC Berkeley? I think so. I think, that, which was crazy, right? You don't name college stadiums after things. So they did all this stuff. And everybody's like, oh, look what, look what this guy's a genius. He's a genius. He's a billionaire. It turns out it was all fake. All of it. Like, like all of it, all of it. So they have a billion dollars of assets, 10 billion of liabilities now. Now they claim, oh, no, we, we found 5 billion more. The guy's saying that FTT has value. FTT has no value. He says that Serum has value. Serum has no value. I mean, all of these things that Sam pumped and dumped through his 200 shell companies, because here's the weird thing, Patrick. I've been doing venture most of my life, either as an allocator to venture, to all the big firms like Kleiner, Sequoia, before they were famous, to Founders Fund, before, you know, before people knew who Peter Thiel was. And I have never seen, not ever, 30 plus years doing this, never seen an individual give a venture fund hundreds of millions of dollars and have that venture fund turn around and put hundreds of millions of dollars in that company. Never seen that before. So that was weird. So then you had this, this weird series of events where it was on my birthday, like, my birthday in 2022 sucked because Terra, I mean, I'm sorry, Luna went to Terra, right? Luna crashes and everybody goes crazy because Three Arrows Capital rolls over. So first dead body, but they weren't the only dead body. FTX was dead. Alameda was dead. It was totally done. So what did they do? The old line, if, if you borrow a thousand dollars from a bank, you have a banker. If you borrow a million, you have a partner. So they had borrowed a bunch of money from Celsius, Voyager, BlockFi, and all these other lenders and put it in fictitious companies. This is the crazy part. 400 venture capital investments inside Alameda Research. 200 of them, half, owned solely by SBF with no business, literally just a web page. So he was using that to launder money into political contributions, which made him one of the largest donors. So then the weird thing happens. Now, I shouldn't speak too much about this because they do regulate me and I don't want to have them, you know, the black hat show up. But there's a guy who runs a certain three-letter institution today who was a professor at MIT. His boss was Caroline's dad. He had no experience in regulation. And he gets appointed to the head of this three-letter industry group. That's just weird. And then he buddies up with Sam to pass legislation that would have basically made everybody else's products and services illegal and FTX positive. So, but it all got blown up by Luna. So Sam tries to go out and save Celsius. Looks at the balance sheet and says, can't save that one. Too big. Go. Okay, you're out. Goes to Voyager. I might be able to save this one if I fake it hard. So puts a lifeline in there. Then he puts a lifeline into BlockFi. And all the while taking real assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum out of these businesses and putting in the SAM coin, the FTT, which had no value. Until CZ says, you know, we've done the audit and there's no there there. So that triggers the collapse. We all saw the November event. Bitcoin makes new lows. Everybody thinks it's the end, but it's not the end because here's why. So yes, the powers that be are fighting. And 
you know, it's not a surprise, right, that the day after it happened, Ms. Warren had a bill, like an 800-page bill. She didn't just whip it up that night. But the next day, she wants to pass a bill making all this stuff illegal. And Janet Yellen, the day after Terra Luna, wanted to make stable coins illegal. That didn't happen in 24 hours. You don't create 800-page bills in 24 hours. You have a plan to systematically weaken the competition. Well, why would you do that? Well, because the banking industry is being displaced by this disruptive innovation, which is an amazing development. I mean, the, the ability to create a unique asset in the digital world is one of the great inventions of our lifetime. Probably the biggest one I'll ever see in my lifetime. And I plan on being here a while. I got a 12 year old. So, um, but it's big and it's really big. And it, it will basically do to the banks what the internet did to media and commerce. And the legacy media and commerce companies went to zero and the new age legacy, I mean, the new age media and commerce companies went to trillions. Same thing's going to happen in banking, but the banks don't want that to happen. So they're pretty tight with these three letter organizations. And I will argue that they have a very significant plan to clamp down, right? Operation Chokehold uh, or Choke Point, Choke Point, I think is the name of it, that they're trying to strangle the on-ramps and off-ramps that you mentioned, Patrick, into and out of digital assets. Now, the thing about that quote from Gandhi that Gandhi didn't say, then you win. The cool thing is if you're already here, we already won. It is as inevitable as night follows day. It is as inevitable as the internet or computing that we will transact all value digitally on blockchains. That is going to happen. There's nothing that's going to stop that. Not, you know, that football league that goes by the same name, not the guy who runs it, you know, who used to work at Goldman Sachs, not the current president, not anybody is going to stop the fact that blockchains are superior technology to databases which we use today. And the Fedwire system is 70-year-old technology, and Visa runs on a, on a mainframe computer, on COBOL. That isn't the future. And so well, they want they want to be they want to be able to print more money, right? I mean, this is this well, is no, a... no, and that's the that's that's the thing, right? Is what Bitcoin in particular, and I have the buy Bitcoin sign back there. What Bitcoin in particular does is it replaces money in the digital age. Now, there's only one money in the world, only one, gold. Gold is the only money in the world. Everything else is currency or credit or debt. It's not money. We use it as a medium of exchange. We use it, we call it money, but it's not money. Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. That is money. And if you look at all currency, it's all based on gold, right? The central banks have gold in their vaults, and then they build the debt on top of it through these mythical operations. And at the end of the day, the reason they do that by fiat, right, by decree, is so that they can steal, because inflation is theft, from the masses, from the average person to the elite. And it's why we have the highest wealth and in income inequality in the history of the world. It's all that wealth gets routed up to the top, because the average person, right, who lives on a fixed income, doesn't own assets, they rent their car, they rent their house, rent their apartment, they don't own anything, they don't own stocks, they don't own bonds, they don't own anything, they have to pay higher prices. And those higher prices go into the pockets of the people at the top who own the stuff. And even better, they own it on leverage because the banks are in cahoots and it increases that wealth. And that game is controlled by the banks and the central banks. They don't want to give it up. Bitcoin actually enables us to opt out for a portion, not for all, but for a portion of our wealth to opt out of that fiat fiasco and preserve your wealth from the ravages of, of inflation. But anyway, I like, you know, I could talk all day about this stuff, but you don't want me to do no, that. No, no, no. That, 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 that's, uh, that, that I, want, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, this is a, uh, it's important time, I think. And I, I think most people probably underestimate the strings that are being pulled, but let's yeah. maybe um, get in a little bit. Uh, Glenn, uh, you want to, you want to kick us off? You want to take, take the next question? 
Yeah, sure. I'd love to build off something you sort of just ended with there, Mark. Speaking of, you know, inflation and sort of the, the stealing effect that goes to consumers, uh, this is sort of twofold. So I was listening to a podcast a while back by uh, Safiya Din Amous, the uh, Bitcoin Standard author, and he was talking a lot about uh, his view on the food system, you know, sort of separate topic, but I think they're pretty related. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking about how he feels that like big corporate interest has really taken over most foods, create these, these fiat foods, you will, with these corn products that can be spun up in mass while trying to keep people consuming less meat. So they're like their average grocery bill remains constant, 2% inflation or whatever. Uh, I also noticed your, your follow uh, Sean Baker on Twitter. So I see you maybe in the, uh, the red meat, red pill space. Um, I am. Sort of food inflation and how that pertains to the whole um, essence of fiat currency. And I, look at, and I love I love the question, Glenn. And and what most people, you know, don't know because they didn't know me when I was when I was young. But I was I wore Husky pants. Husky was a brand that Sears Roebuck had that were for fat kids. Um, you know, I'll not say fat anymore, but um, I was fat and like really fat. And over the, and the reason I was is because I ate garbage, right? I ate seed oils and I ate sugar and I drank Coca-Cola, like by the two liter bottles of it and my bag of, you know, Butterfinger and that nonsense, that fiat food, that stuff, you go and walk into a, a mini mart, stand at the door and look inside. I defy you to find one thing other than water that you should actually put in your body. There's nothing in a mini mart that you should put in your body ever, like, like ever. And it's, it's insane, but that is, and there's a reason for it, right? They, they inverted the food pyramid back in the 1950s, right before I was born. And if you think about your body, it's made up of water. It's made up of fat. It's made up of protein. It's not made up of carbohydrates. It's just not. And this idea that we should have a maximum intake of carbohydrates is completely upside down, completely upside down. And sugar and corn, corn syrup, corn meal, corn, everything is essentially poison as are seed oils like, you know, rapeseed oil and, and cottonseed oil. These were waste products, right? They made paint out of linseed oil. And now they put it in a jar and you're supposed to fry your food in it. It's like, oh my God. And why? Well, because it's cheap and it maximizes the profits for the food industry. And it's the same thing about money, right? They want you addicted to cheap money, money that can be cheapened at a whim by the central government. And you know, here's, here's the weird thing. So I'm sitting in, in my house in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and according to Zillow, Right, my house went up forty percent in the last twelve months. My house didn't grow; it didn't get more efficient; it didn't get more useful. In fact, it wore out a little bit, and I had to put some money into it to keep it where it is. No, what happened is the money got worse because from March of 2020, when we did the dumbest thing, maybe in the history of dumb things. At, at a political level by locking down the world in response to the flu, we created half of all the dollars in the history of the United States in 18 months. Now, if you think about it, if you have a trillion dollars, trillion, see, no one responds when I use the T word, a trillion. We'd have to sit here together on this podcast for 31,710 years, which I promise would be most unpleasant and spend a dollar every second, that's one trillion. So if you have a trillion over here and you print another trillion, what just happened to the value of your money? Just got cut in half. So what should have happened? Well, the price of gold should have doubled, hmm, but it didn't, why not? Well, because JP Morgan does something called spoofing, and you can read about this, they paid a billion dollar fine last year for doing this, right? They manipulate the price of gold to keep it down because it makes people feel better that there's no inflation if the gold price doesn't go up. But gold is priced in dollars. And if you destroyed the dollar and a half, the gold price should have doubled, but it didn't. So they paid a billion dollar fine, but they're like, yeah, but we made 20 billion. So yeah, it's just cost doing business, 5%, no big deal. Well, Bitcoin should have doubled. It did, precisely. It went from like, you know, 11,000 bucks to 20 something thousand dollars. It precisely doubled over the three year period. 
Everybody says, no, no, it went down from 70,000. No, the 70,000 was never real. That was speculative excess created by leverage in the system. And it wasn't real, just like most of the stuff in food isn't real food. Meat is real food. Vegetables are real food. Triscuits, not real food. Ritz crackers, not real food. Oreos, oh my God. Not, not, I mean, nothing in an Oreo should ever go in your body. Now, I will eat one on occasion because, you know, whatever, but never, ever should you put that in your body. So, like, we made a ton of money on this thing called Beyond Meat, right? Fake meat. There's nothing in Beyond Meat that I would put in my body. Now, I'm happy. We turned 3 million bucks into 150 million bucks. Super happy about that. Love it. And actually, they rolled it out up at uh, Tony what, what, um, Hortons, Tim Hortons, Tim Hortons up in, in Canada. And actually, I was in Canada for the release, like the, the week that they released it. And the reason was, we asked my 12-year-old who was nine, three years ago. So, so Will, where do you want to go on vacation? He said, Canada. Well, what? Why Canada? And he said, because I want to go to a foreign country, and it's the closest one. So we're going to Canada. I'm like, Okay. So we went up to Toronto and Montreal and had a blast and, and went into Tim Hortons and saw people lining up to buy this incredibly over-processed seed oil, latent, laden, horrible food. And this idea that, well, anyway, one, one last story on that. So the reason that meat has been vilified and cholesterol has been vilified and fat has been vilified is because the corn industry and the sugar industry wanted to sell you more sugar. So they made sugar, they made fat the enemy and sugar the savior, like snack wells, right? There's a, there's a famous Seinfeld, you guys are too young to know Seinfeld, but there's this TV show on when I was growing up called Seinfeld. And I mean, you know, you know who Jerry Seinfeld is, but he has this one thing where they're all eating low fat yogurt and they're all ballooning up, right? Because it's full of sugar. Um, but the same thing true here is they they replaced all the good ingredients with fiat. Why? Well, one of our presidents, I can't remember which one it was, uh, right before Hoover, I can't remember his name, had a heart attack and very public and everybody was all concerned about it. And the margarine industry sponsored a study to show that it was because of eating saturated fat, eating meat, because they wanted you to eat their margarine. So they paid for the study. And this is the best part. So they studied 21 countries around the world and they plotted all the dots and there was no correlation, zero correlation. So they excluded the nine countries that were off the, the chart and drew a line claiming that there was a correlation between saturated fat and heart disease, which there isn't. And so that's why safety and, and I eat lots of meat and Dr. Sean and Dr. Parker and uh, Baker. Um, and I love them, right? I mean, I love when he posts pictures of the heads of our health departments around the world, who are these big, gigantic people, versus him, who at you know fifty, I think he's fifty-eight years old. I watched him deadlift four hundred and five pounds or something like seventeen times. I'm gonna take my advice from him. <laughs> I think you might be referring to Calvin Coolidge, by the way. Coolidge, uh, thank you. Glenn, do you want to, uh, is there a part you want to wrap up in yours and then we'll kick it to Jake after? Yeah, Please. I mean, I think the, the big you know thing there is that they want to keep these systems in place, whether it be the, the monetary system or the dietary system, because money. it's money for the people up top and, you know, it's it's ignorance is bliss for the people down below, right? You know, keep it, keep the wheel turning, keep the profits printing up top. Obviously, uh, they try to demonize red meat. They also try to demonize Bitcoin in the same way. And you know, once you once you sort of wake up to one, you start to think about the other. You know, personally, I've I've gone down both the rabbit holes over the last two years of my life. You know, whether it be through the food I eat or the you know, the investments I make and how I save personally. So yeah, it's good to good to hear it from your side as well. And I agree fully. Yeah. I, actually, I want to uh, do it really quick, and I'll kick it to you, Jake. Um, like we started funding university programs back like 2017 yep. and there was stig stigma then where some blockchain clubs like in 2017 2018 they were getting like letters from the university like hey we, you can't be involved in this like drug coin thing right yes. like there was still this like dark silk road dark net have you guys seen anything at the university level like 
people's interest or students like since like the FTX thing like has there has you got have you guys seen sentiment change like either in official capacity or just like student interest or anything I'm just curious yeah good question because I know Jake's got a lot of good questions to ask but yeah we saw our workshop attendance I think go half the week we had the developer course we're doing I think 60 a week come out learn how to code on, on EVM but now it was like went 60 to 20 and like the first week after FTX our university has like a graduate research program in blockchain so I think like the the overall sentiments okay uh at like the administrative level but students ask us all the time like oh isn't still like oh isn't this just like a a scam and like yeah most of crypto is a scam but not like not the real good stuff sure sure yeah happy to hear your thoughts Jake and then if you want to go ahead and uh, fire a question at Mark yeah I mean just my thoughts on that last point there so I've been involved with Texas blockchain for a year and a half now and you know during the peak of the market last year, we had probably about 78 people showing up to our meetings. But the, this demographic, it was people that were just looking to get something on their resume, just like looking to get involved with the current trends. And now we're seeing 40, 50 people, but people that are showing up every week, actually engaging in the community, actually trying to learn the content, doing kind of this side opportunities that we're offering them. So while it's not like as large of a number, um, I think it's more concentrated in terms of actual interest and talent. And I think that's kind of yep. how the, the the speculation argument goes, where like you go up, but then you come down to a higher baseline. I think that's that's kind of what I see in, in the blockchain club as well. So that's my take on that. Uh, I, I love this whole conversation because I'm act I've actually read like the the book, what is it, the great cholesterol myth. Uh, you know, I can be eating a pound of, of ground ground meat, some eggs and, and some butter, and I'll get 20 people being like, what the hell are you doing? Like, you're going to get heart disease in, in two years while they sit there eating their Chick-fil-A that has 20 ingredients in their uh, grilled chicken, and they're drinking their Sprite full with uh, uh, ingredients I can't even pronounce. So yeah. um, going down that rabbit hole and then the rabbit hole of the uh, subsidization of corn, soy, and wheat. And, you know, not, not to get into this, but all the chickens now just dying. Um, you know, it's it, that's, a, that's a rabbit hole in and of itself. But well, no, no, look, to that point, Jake, look at before we started having these chemical spills and these train derailments for the past year. Food processing plants, chicken processing plants, um, meat processing plants were just spontaneously catching fire. There was another one uh, two nights ago. and. Again, it's it's not coincidence. And everybody says, oh, that's a conspiracy. It's only a conspiracy if it isn't true. Truth is an absolute defense, right? If something is true, you don't have to be sorry about it. You don't have to apologize for talking about it. You don't have to uh, not talk about it. In fact, you should talk about it. But truth is a really interesting thing. And it's it's part of part of the reason that I came so far into this space is what blockchain technology does. It replaces trust with truth. And for 800 years, we've had to trust each other and banks and institutions and governments. And what we've learned recently, uh, actually, we've learned it, we've always known it, uh, you can't trust them um, because they're in it for personal gain. And But they've always been, right? From the Romans to the Ottomans to the British Empire, right? I just saw this. Um, uh, what's that book? Roald Dahl uh, book. They just got edited, updated. And they took out Rudyard Kipling, Kipling, right? Pretty famous poet, pretty pretty good guy. I, well, I should people don't think he's a good guy, right? Because he was all for colonialism. Like in 1899, lots of people were for colonialism. And yeah, we can say it's wrong now with the benefit of hindsight, but at the time, I I, I think that's real, right? And, and if you know to to just take him out of the book because you don't like what he stood for, it's just crazy. So now we have to trust the editors and it's like, well, who's making the rules? I'll tell you, the mutual fund industry, massive industry, right? Everybody thinks it's great. Everybody loves, you know, John Bogle, right? Who passed the law in 1986 to switch from defined benefit where the pension plan took care of the pensioners to a plan where the individual with no experience and access to not full tools, because you're prohibited from investing in the good stuff, that's safe for the rich people. Who passed that rule? What? The mutual fund companies, Vanguard, BlackRock, 
Fidelity, they were on the committee that drafted because they paid. So we have to consider the source, like who created the food pyramid? Shocking, the food companies, like Quaker Oats, people think it's a health food. It's like one of the worst things, again, you can put in your body. It spikes your insulin, terrible for you, horrible. But you know, we've been told it's a health food our whole lives. And then you start looking into who, who made this whole change to sugar being healthier than fat. And then you get to the sugar lobby and their influence on the government and the ties between the ties. Let, let me let me steer this a little bit though. Sorry, no, I, I did have a question that, that, okay, that related to this regarding the money. So, like one of one of my like and, and regarding digital currency. So um at UTI, I actually instructed the undergraduate class for cryptocurrency and blockchain. We do like an introduction to money and introduction to Bitcoin. Um, and I absolutely love like the history of money. It's like one of my favorite things to just learn about on the side. Mm -hmm. And you kind of brought it up there, but over history as we kind of know it, or as, yeah, history as we know it, massive empires, massive powers, and even small civilizations have come to an end because of greed and corruption and ending with tons and tons of debt. Yep. So with the rise of Bitcoin and other digital currencies and among some people growing distrust in central authorities and control of our money and data, there are so many different aspects of a good currency, transferability, durability, scarcity, divisibility. I'm sure you've heard them all. Yep. What do you think is the most important trait or aspect of a good currency? And do you see that playing no, out? No, yes. All, all the things that you just said, right? Um, it has to be portable. It has to be divisible. It has to be durable. Um, it has to be fungible. Uh, and if you think about it, for 5,000 years, which is a long time, Right? Most of kind of real human history, 5,000 years, an ounce of gold, single ounce of gold has bought a fine person's suit from Cleopatra's time to a suit of armor, to a zoot suit in the thirties, to Savile Row today. Um, one ounce, fine person suit. So, okay. Why is that? Well, it's because it checks off all those things about what makes money, money. But then what happens is governments come in and they realized that, you know, if I get one of these printing presses and I can just, you know, literally print in the old days, print paper, like, you know, the Weimar with the wheelbarrows and, or, or, you know, we've all seen the pictures I actually have in my office around the other side of the house, uh, a 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollar bill, which would not buy a loaf of bread, right? So you're a trillionaire in Zimbabwe. You had this thing, 100 trillionaire, but you can't buy a loaf of bread because they printed too many dollars. So there were 775 paper currencies in the history of the world. Three quarters of them no longer exist. The oldest, the pound sterling, 392 or three years old. It used to take one pound of silver for one pound note, hence the name. Today, it's like 174 pounds to get a pound note. So the, the challenge is the, the diminution of value by the creation of money by fiat has gone on for centuries. And that's why the history of money is replete with examples of booms and busts and epics where, you know, the world reserve currency used to be Portugal, right? Why? Why Portugal? Well, Portugal had the tallest trees, therefore they had the fastest ships and the most powerful navy. Spain took them over. So Spain had the world reserve currency. Then the Rothschilds created the central bank. I'm sorry, no, the French. The French took over Spain. So they had, the, and then the Rothschilds created the central bank in 1600. And took over France um, by funding the war at the central bank by printing money. And since then, the Rothschilds have controlled everything, right? Half the Rothschilds went to the England, Bank of England. They created the steamship. They became the most powerful navy. Then we invented nuclear and had the most powerful navy. Now, what's interesting is that I believe the next world reserve currency won't be Bitcoin. That's the second step. The next iteration, I think, will be the renminbi. Because the Chinese have figured out the next war is going to be fought with chips, not ships. It's not about naval superiority anymore. It's about superiority of tech, particularly AI. 96% of AI citations this year are from China. Unbelievable, right? They are the vast leaders, right? Chat, GPT, great, whatever, you know, natural language processing, yay, or, you know, images with five fingers, or I mean, with seven fingers and, you know, all kinds of weird stuff. 
and a couple of the images, like I did, I did the thing that everyone's doing. And a couple of the pictures were good. My son even said, hey, that kind of looks like you, dad. And there was one that looked like Harrison Ford. And I'm like, yeah, I like that one. But um, most of them were unrecognizable. I'm like, okay, great. So AI is not going to take over the world. Um, still can't think. Right? It can do things faster, but it still can't think. It's not sentient. And <laughs> I know Patrick did not plan for us to talk about all the things that we talked about on this call. That's because the brain functions very differently. And you hear something and it triggers an idea, a response. Computers can't do that. Never going to be able to. I don't think ever be able to do that. So back, back to your point on money, the, the world reserve currency is important because that country does have the advantage of incurring debt longer than it should before it collapses. And you know, I think that's what's you know, been the benefit for the United States for a long time mostly because of the oil uh, industry pricing things in dollars, but that's changing now with the ruble and, and the renminbi. But ultimately, a good currency has to be both a store of value and a medium of exchange. Today, Bitcoin, like gold, is a store of value. It's a superior store of value because it's more divisible and more portable. Like if I had a bar of gold and I tried to break it into four pieces, I couldn't do it, right? No, no matter how much I, you know, study shot or uh, Barker, I'm not gonna be able to break that bar of gold. Even if I could, I couldn't stuff it in my computer and send it to you guys. I can send you sats instantaneously using this thing. And all the Bitcoin in the world fits right here. I don't have all the Bitcoin in the world. In fact, I don't keep any of my phone, but um, I have a SIM swap twice because people think I do, which is crazy. But the... The point I'm trying to make there is Bitcoin, digital gold, probably another layer will be the currency. I hope it's not CBDCs. I think those are pure evil, like evil incarnate. I'm hopeful it's more like a lightning or an L3 above that. Because if you think about money, gold is the base. Then there's Fedwire and ACH. And, and then we have Visa, which is kind of like a database that we all think of as money, but my Visa card isn't money. It's just a plastic thing that they keep a, a journal on and I settle up once a month going to Fedwire. So anyway, I forgot what the on, original on, question on, was. Well, on, on that point, actually, one, one thing I'd like to get your thoughts on is um, to, to me, there was always like this one threat, like one threshold that would never be crossed. Like if you say, okay, uh, America, they yeah. with some en enemies like North Korea, like Russia, they knew they were never going to drop a bomb on them if they didn't get their way. Correct. So how did they attack them? They they there was always this theory that when anything hit the fan, they were going to cut Russia off from the global banking system, from the SWIFT system, yeah. and that it was going to be so debilitating to them that they would have to give in and and stop whatever action you know they didn't want yeah, to take. That was the plan. That was absolutely yeah, so not, the plan, Patrick. So, so they just rolled that in, and, and then it's like Russia just kind of didn't care, more or less, or they formed alliances well, they, with they other They created countries. their own system, right? What's happening yeah. right now that people aren't really paying attention to that's really important is in 1971, which is interesting because that was the date that the WEF was incorporated. So let that sink in for a second. So WEF was incorporated, and we cut a deal with Saudi Arabia that we would price, that we would protect protect Saudi Arabia at all costs, no matter what they did to us or anybody else, we would protect them so long as they priced all global oil transactions in dollars. And anyone who threatened that was made to disappear. Qaddafi said, I'm going to price in gold. He disappeared. Saddam Hussein said, I'm going to price in euros. He disappeared. So if you threatened that hegemony, you disappeared. And anyone who threatened it, who had nuclear weapons, we just weaponized against them. So China, Russia, we couldn't attack them, right? You can't make Putin disappear because they have nuclear. So what do you do? You try to exclude Russia from the you know, global banking system. You try to freeze their assets. And what do they do? They just keep pumping oil and selling it. So they filled their coffers back up and oil prices spiked to 120 bucks and they made more money 
then were hurt by the, the restrictions. But then they cut a deal with China, and now they're going to price oil transactions between Russia and China in renminbi and ruble. So they are sowing the seeds of the dollar's demise in response to us thinking we can take them down through sanctions. Look, sanctions is just a fancy term for starving women and children. Right? If we called it that, we probably wouldn't do it very often. But that's what a sanction really is. You're basically taking you know, bread out of you know, women and children's mouths because you're mad at the, the men who are in charge of the country. And it's, it's a bad thing, but we've been doing it for a long time. In fact, there's this, there's this great two minutes in the Michael Moore film, uh, Roger and Me, uh, that talks about the history of the U.S. doing this with sanctions all, all through the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. It's, the movie's not very good, but that, that, sec, that, that section is, is actually pretty good. Anyway. Yeah, no, it, it feels like to me like those, that was kind of the beginning of a tipping point, right? Like uh, if, that, if, the, if that is no longer the threat, then this is kind of like inherently where, you know, you can, you can draw parallels to why they're scared of Bitcoin. But hey, uh, Glenn, uh, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Patrick. So some interesting things that you brought up there at the end, Mark, uh, specifically in light of trends like de-dollarization, um, rising BRICS influence in the global mm -hmm. economic uh, scene and also like increased gold and silver demand. You know, I was doing a quick macro overview last month for, for uh, Sarah Fund and just throughout the time researching it, I noticed, you know, 60 year, 55 year highs in precious metal purchases, Saudi Arabia at the uh, Davos conference hinting that they're open to settling in other currencies. You know, I think it may have been um, in light of like the, the Afghanistan, like, mess up on the sort of yep. so the US military is maybe not the top dog anymore. But, you know, as an investor, and as an allocator, how are you sort of approaching these trends of global de-dollarization and like influence uh, in the East? You know, I know I have a big part of your portfolio in private equity in China. So how are you yep. allocating and advising others to allocate in, in these times? So again, really <laughs> important points. Uh, one is, you know, king dollar dethroned. Right, I even hashtag it and use it a lot. It's so funny. People yell at me all the time, like, why do you use so many hashtags? I'm like, they're not for you. They're for me. They're a filing system because I can do that hashtag and I can see everything I ever tweeted about that particular topic. So they're not for everybody else. They're for me. Um, but you know, hashtag King Dollar Dethroned is, is real in that I believe the dollar is on its way out. I think the Chinese RMB is, is ascendant. You know, they became a world reserve currency four years ago. I think they will become the world reserve currency sometime probably over the next decade. And why is that? Well, if you go back 20 years, the Chinese, it was all about made in China, right? Which is why dollar domination was so important because uh, we wanted to buy stuff from them for cheap. So uh, we would you know, collect our oil you know, hegemonic uh, dominated royalties from around the world. And then we would, you know, export our labor and our pollution. You know, look at a picture of LA in 1971. It looked like Beijing, right? It was horrible. Fog, smog was terrible. You know, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire because they were pumping effluent down it. I mean, we were bad polluters. And we took all that and sent it to China so we could buy good stuff. But today, it's not about that anymore. Now, it's about made for China. China is the greatest consumptive force the world has ever seen. Over the last 30 years, they took 700 million people out of abject poverty and put them into the middle class. And what do middle class people do? They spend. So they are going from the manufacturing warehouse of the world to the consumer uh, of the world. And that's 700 million people. And here's the crazy thing. Everyone talks about all the millennials. You know, you guys are part of that. Um, we've got, you know, 84 million millennials, more than us boomers. Okay. It's cool. It's good. Okay. That's the next generation. There's 330 million millennials in China. It's just big. And so the idea that they're going to stop, you know, buying cars and scooters and apartments and air conditioners and, and all things that, that, require these these base metals, not just precious metals, but base metals had a great year last year. Uh, copper, right? Now an EV uses 40 pounds of copper because of all the wires. So copper is going to become more and more scarce. So China is certainly a big part of, of what we do. Uh, emerging markets, 
And, and look, emerging markets were tough for the last five years, really the last eight years, because the U.S. post-gold financial crisis basically held interest rates at zero six, seven years longer than they should have. You know, we had emergency interest rates for forever. And so we we basically crushed the, the souls of all these people who had... Um, you know, denominated their their debt in in dollars by weakening our currency. Uh, and once we got what we wanted, then we could let the currency strengthen. It strengthened, you know, at one point eighteen percent last year, and it finished the year only up only up eight because it it collapsed. In October of last year, China started printing money again. They started anticipating reopening after this ridiculously stupid COVID zero policy, which we don't have time to talk about. Um, but I think it was all part of the plan. And they printed a trillion, there's a T word again, trillion dollars of liquidity. And that is why Bitcoin is pumping this year. It's why cryptos are pumping this year. It's why economic growth is recovering. You saw the PMI this morning. And it's not because of the United States. It's not because, you know, Jay Powell is a, is a wizard. He's actually been restricting liquidity. It's because the People's Bank of China is printing money like, like it's going out of style. And so... That has been Xi's plan all along, right? He wants them to be a consumptive force and Putin figured it out. And that's why they've got the big alignment. Saudi figured it out, to your point. They're like, huh, I know we cut a deal in 1971. And here was the thing, you, you could see it happening in real time. So last January, we do this thing called the 10 surprises. And last January, I did one saying, look, it's an election year. Oil's about 120 bucks, no way. It can be 120 bucks by election because there's a perfect inverse correlation between the popularity of a president and the price of gasoline. So you needed gas sub three dollars in order for the Democrats to win. And he tried, right? He went to Saudi and he told MBS he wanted them to pump more to lower oil prices. And they said, mm, we got new friends. We like these guys more. And what did Biden do? I, I give him a little bit of credit for being resourceful. He came home and he drained the SPR. And he got oil prices down to 75 bucks and gas was right around $3 and Democrats did just fine. And now we got to replenish the SPR. That's a whole other kettle of fish. But um, I do think back to this, this issue of, of where do you allocate? I think everybody, everybody has to have a portion of their assets in Bitcoin, everybody. And the, and the younger you are, the bigger the percentage. Like for someone my age, three, four, five percent, whatever, you got to have it um, as you're running money. And the younger you are, the more you can have. In fact, there's this interesting digital divide. Right? If I ask anyone over 35, who's your broker? I don't know, UBS, Merrill Lynch, why? How much gold do you have? I don't know, three, four percent. How much Bitcoin do you have? Oh, are you kidding me? Zero. It's a Ponzi scheme. I haven't heard that Peter Schiff guy. How often do you use DeFi? What's DeFi? Ask anyone under 35, who's your broker? What's a broker? I mean, I got a Robinhood account. Yeah. How much gold do you have? Oh, are you kidding me? Boomer rocks zero. I haven't heard that Peter Schiff guy. How much Bitcoin do you have? I don't want to talk about it. Why not? Because it's like a really big part of my net worth. I'm kind of embarrassed about it. Um, how often do you DeFi? Every day. So that digital divide is really important. There's 37 trillion trillion dollars from my generation, it's going to y'all, right? Going from the boomers to the zoomers. That's not going to stay in TradFi. It's just not. It's not going to stay at UBS and Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs and you know Wells Fargo. It's going to go into digital assets. And the Gen A's, right? The kids who are being born like right now. So I, you know, my newest grandbaby is, is a Gen A. They will never have, I don't have it with me, a a leather wallet. Never. They will never have, they will never know paper money. They will have digital wallets. They will spend in digital currency. They won't know what paper currency is. The world will be very different. Probably not too far off about that. Hey, Jake, uh, you want to, you want to hop in here? Yeah, I'd love to ask. I, I know we don't have that much longer, but just kind of one more like kind of macro web three question. The question that I get a lot just being Texas blockchain, the blockchain course, and my my startup is what's your favorite use case of blockchain? And obviously, we focused a lot in this conversation on the financial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, 
I've thought about this a lot. And while I wish I had the firsthand experience and know about of like the dot-com boom from the learning that I've done, I imagine people didn't really see the best use cases of the internet in let's say 2000. It looks like it took people many years to build what yeah. would become the huge internet-based value creating companies that we have today. So with that kind of said, I'd love to know if you think that the best use cases of blockchain currently exist and just need to be flushed out or if the largest innovations are yet to even be thought of and released into the market. No, it's great. It's a great question. So, so kind of in the sense that you know, Bitcoin is and always will be one of the best use cases of blockchain technology. Um, it benefits from the law of increasing returns, meaning it's not the best technology that wins, it's the technology that gets critical mass first. And it does something that nothing else can do uh, as elegantly and simply, which is it creates a unique digital asset uh, that can't be replicated, that's permanent, immutable, and, and that's incredible. And, and Eric Schmidt even said, look, some companies can be built around that. So you know, digital gold or the core of the monetary system, that's done. That that that's Bitcoin. Now, beyond that, look, pets.com, the poster child for the failure of the internet. Chewy.com, same company, exactly same company, $30 billion company. Webvan, failure, Amazon, same company. I mean, not exactly, but elements of you know, delivery of groceries, you know, door, maybe it's DoorDash is a better comp, same company. So the use cases evolved because you have these series of inflection points. The reason the internet didn't catch on in 2000, dial-up modems sucked, right? I mean, you had to wait four hours for a song to download, four days for a movie. No one will wait four days for that movie or something would happen to your computer and you have to start it over. No way. So when they tried, they started sending discs out. Netflix started as discs. And that failed and they almost went bankrupt. Then they tried video on demand, but it took four days and that almost failed. They almost went bankrupt. And it wasn't until broadband came along from South Korea. And we're like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll wait 20 minutes for a movie to download. Okay, now it's instantaneous. So that series of innovations happens. And Mark Andreessen even said it. He said, all these ideas that you're all pissing on in 2001 and 2002, looking at the tech crash, they're all great ideas and they're all going to happen. It's just going to take a while. And they all happen. I mean, I remember when we invested in Google in 96, when I was at Notre Dame and the board was like, that's stupid. It's a dumb word. It's a dumb name. Now it's a verb. Like you aspire to be a verb in your life, right? That's a good thing. Or eBay, right? Where we made 96 times our money. They said, you're going to invest in a garage sale company online. It's a little more than a garage sale company, but yeah, basically. So the same thing will happen with, with blockchain. The blockchain does two things that nothing else can do. So one, it replaces trust with truth. 800 years, uh, we had to deal with trust. So in the old days, I lent Patrick money and I wrote down in my book, Patrick owes me hundred bucks. He comes back a year later with his 110 bucks. I'm like, oh, Patrick, you owe me 220. He's like, what? No, I only borrowed hundred. Says right here in the book. 200 because I'm an unscrupulous guy and I wrote 200. So the Medici's came along 800 years ago and said, ah, we can solve this. We, the benevolent Medici's, Patrick, you keep a ledger, Mark, you keep a ledger. And we, for a small fee, will determine that the ledgers match. Unless I bribed the Medici's who were very subject to bribery. And then I still had 200 and he had to pay me 200. So that system has been corrupt since the day it was formed. But it was all about trusting that third party. Like this, I, I have this nightmare. I go to the ATM, I punch in my code, and it says zero. Like, shit, how would I prove it's not zero? I don't have a statement. I haven't had statements in years. It's their word against mine. If they say I don't have any money, I don't have any money. If you were in Cyprus six years ago, you woke up, you went to the bank, you had 25 cents on the dollar because they took 75 cents to deal with the Russian crisis. So if you've got money in the bank, it's not your money. So that needs to get solved. And that that will get solved by having this digital asset. And proof of work is very important. And that's why I love proof of work. I don't really like proof of stake because proof of stake has all the same problems that the Medici's had. But a, a triple entry ledger, right? If I want to send money to Patrick, 
today, he has to have a bank account. I have to have a bank account and pay a wire fee. If I send him value using this, I can send him a Bitcoin. Everyone on this call says, yep, Mark has a Bitcoin. Yep, he sent it to Patrick. Patrick has it. Good, we're done. Consensus, proof of work, we're done. That can't be messed with. It's immutable. It's permanent. And that's amazing. The second thing the blockchain does is provenance and, and integrity of data. And I tell the story that my mom almost died because she went to a hospital that was out of her system or whatever. And the doctor wasn't allowed to get her file from the other system. So he treated her without knowing that she had all these issues and they almost killed her. And thankfully she didn't die. But how do you treat a patient if you can't see their file? That should be like against the law. But it's actually worse than not against the law. It's actually the way the system's set up because you have these warring factions on, on systems. So that will all go away when we collectively use blockchain to own our data, our identity. You know, why do I have to fill out my freaking name and address and phone number and credit card number every single time? It should look at my face and populate, right? It should, you know, use near field communication from my phone or what, whatever we want to use. And that, that will eventually happen and it will all be on chain and it'll be owned by us and the provenance of our of our assets, right? Every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every collectible car, every case of fine wine, every house, every private business, all $700 trillion of global assets will be on blockchains. All value will be exchanged across blockchains. And all of it will reduce the $7 trillion of friction that the Medici's and the JP Morgan's and the Rothschilds have been stealing for 800 years, right? Didn't used to be 7 trillion. Today it's 7 trillion, didn't start at 7 trillion. But today it's 7 trillion of waste because of all these systems and all the corruption. And that all will eventually disappear, which is pretty cool. Well, all right, guys, this has uh, been a pretty exciting conversation. I think we've definitely covered a wide range of topics. Uh, I know we're kind of bumping up against time here. Um, but Mark, I'll, I'll have you take us out. Uh, just, you know, a quick snapshot. Like when you look out the next year, where do you see this heading? Like the acceleration oh, of like- Look, it's like, right here on the screen. It's right here on the screen, right? You got You got old guys like me, who are leaving the traditional finance world and seeing the light. You got, you know, tweeners like yourself who have built amazing businesses to support. This is the cool part on, on the, my left side of the screen. Um, when I see the talent that is migrating into this space, it's like nothing I've ever seen. And I lived through some amazing, like the 2000 tech bubble, incredible talent migration. But this time, the best and the brightest of every school around the world aren't going to consulting. They're not going to iBanking. They're not going to tech. They're not going to healthcare. They're coming to digital assets. 30% of MIT's master's in engineering program this year are going into crypto. 30%. I mean, those kids could go anywhere they want, anywhere in the world, any job, world is their oyster. They're going into digital. And that's despite all the negatives and all the problems. So when I look out one year, three years, five years, 10 years, I just get super excited. It's because people follow great ideas. Ideas come from this evolution of technology. This is an evolution. It's not a revolution. The problem was for years, it was a revolution. It was the cypherpunks and the anarchists and you know Tim May famously wrote the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto, which if, if you haven't read, go read it. It's amazing. Um, and it basically predicted everything that would happen over the next 30 years. But it took 20 years for Satoshi to come along and actually do any of it because he was an anarchist and he lived up in the mountains by himself and he had no friends. And so that, you know, libertarian kind of burn it all down doesn't work. What has to happen is an evolution of the systems that we have to better. And that's where we are today. So that's why I get so excited. That's why I'm here. Awesome. Well, everyone, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the conversation and uh, appreciate you making the time, Mark, uh, Jake, Glenn. It was uh, nice, nice for you guys to join as well. I think we'll be doing another one of these over, over the next month or so. Make sure to invite everyone back and uh, everyone enjoy this feed and have a great day. Appreciate you guys' time, man. Yeah?
All right. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Nice to meet you.